um, rather than give you guys some free time to go make some trouble, I'm going to pinch hit real quickly. We decided this morning I had a little presentation that I could throw up, and I'll probably try to catch us a little bit back on time and get, get done a little bit early. Um, but um, some of you will recognize this. I don't know if I've given this talk actually in the US, so there may be some foreign language slides in the middle of it. I didn't get everything translated. <laughs> Um, but this forms up a, a, a part of Stephen Fillmore's Fuels Academy stuff, and so for some of you who've done that, you'll know a little bit of this presentation. Um, it's, a, it's notably different than what Walt was going to talk about, stand age, global change, carbon sequestration, and productivity. What I'm going to be talking about simply is the relationship between restoration and actual management uh, in chaparral versus in frequent fire forest types, because we found that a lot of people don't get the difference. And so it actually builds a little bit on what Janet was talking about. Uh, forgive me, I, I have a reputation for going very quickly through things, which I fight, but I'm going to succumb to it, and I'm going to go very fast through this stuff. So forgive me. Anyway, here's my outline. I'm not even going to talk about it. Um, so what is, what is restoration? Well, restoration is the process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that's been degraded, damaged, or destroyed, according to the Society for Ecological Restoration. It's basically an intentional activity that helps an ecosystem or seeks to help an ecosystem with respect to its health, its integrity, or its sustainability. You've got to have some kind of reference or desired condition. Sometimes the two can be the same thing. Typically restoration, and this is kind of what the word means in English, is the sort of uh, return, if you will, to some previous better state. In the U.S., we tend to lamentably, I think, a little bit associate this with the time before those nasty Euro-Americans showed up on the landscape. And a restored ecosystem ideally is relatively self-sustaining and resilient to ecological processes of disturbance and you've restored key ecological processes. It often requires a long-term commitment. So in California, in a lot of the ecosystems, fire is one of is the keystone ecological process. And as you know, fire has been heavily suppressed in most forests in California for nearly a century. This has led to an accumulation of forest fuels. On the other hand, there are, there are places in California, most notably in Southern California, and to an extent around the Bay Area, where high area, uh, areas of, of high humid ignition have had the reverse effect, right? Essentially where we have fire frequencies now in areas dominated by things like coastal sage scrub or chaparral, for example, uh, where excessively high frequencies are leading to, to major uh, environmental degradation. Third, human population is growing very rapidly. Janet showed some evidence uh, to that. You may know that already California is one out of every eight Americans. That's a statistic that always just amazes me. And then finally, warming climates are extending the fire season, augmenting water stress, increasing our nursery for fire. Okay, so oh yeah, California population growth. You've seen that stuff. You also probably know from reading the literature uh, uh, that uh, fire frequency, fire severity, fire size, fire everything is going up. We are all going to burn up at some point. So um, the framework for my for my um, for my uh, talk is basically fire regimes, and I'm going to use a very simplified version of the fire regime. This is the the Schmidt et al. 2002 fire regime from fire regimes from uh, the Land Fire Project. This has essentially become a standard for the United States. There are many components to fire regime, but this one only uses fire frequency and fire severity, which is actually quite common. And I'm going to be talking about fire regime one forests, i.e you know, sort of Mediterranean type or drier yellow pine and mixed conifer type systems. These are very common in the Sierra Nevada, but also in the higher mountains in Southern California. We call this fire regime one. And I'm also going to be talking about, in contrast, what we call fire regime four, which is represented in California by a lot of shrubland systems, including chaparral, as well as serotonous conifers. Um, and this is, uh, as Janet alluded to, this is a, a very low frequency, but very high severity. Uh, uh, fire regime type. These are really different systems, but the two of them together uh, encompass most of the land base, uh, certainly for the national forest. So this picture right here, this is from uh, uh, a mapping tool that we developed a few years ago, which has uh, become a little bit of a go-to for at least the, for the forest in Southern California. We call it Fire Return Interval Departure, or FRID. We, bar we borrowed this concept from the national parks and then extended it and essentially what this map is doing is it's taking the vegetation types in the landscape, it's associating a pre-Euro-American settlement fire frequency with those types, and then it's taking the last century of data that we have from the California Fire Perimeters data set, and it's comparing the two, all right? What you can see is that kind of amazingly, Southern California has a real strong schizophrenia in fire regime departures right now. The higher mountains, which are colored red in this uh, uh, diagram, at one point, not too far in the past, had very, very frequent fire, mostly initiated by lightning, through relatively easy fuels to burn. These were what we call fuel-limited types, and I'll refer back to them in a second. 
Today, however, because it's relatively speaking, relatively easy to stop fires in forest systems under moderate conditions because the, the surface fuels and the canopy fuels generally have some sort of disattachment right between them. Those systems, we've been very successful at putting almost all fire out for 100 years, 98% of fire or more, all right? So you've gone from high fire frequency to very low fire frequency, but an accumulation of fuels such that when they burn now, they burn a lot like chaparral. The lowland you see is all in cool colors and it's exactly the opposite situation. Systems that probably saw a fire every 30 to 100 years, now they see a fire every well on the Pepperdine campus every seven years. I don't know what kind of people you guys are graduating over there, but they need to stop that now. Um, but parts of the Angeles National Forest as well have seen very, very high frequencies of fire. And so the environmental degradation in this case is by high fire frequencies. Okay, well, this is a map that uh, we published in 2014, and it shows how different Northern and Southern California are. The Northern California, it's got the standard sort of Western fire problem that we worked for so long to kind of to educate politicians about, and that is a lack of long-term fire has led to lots of fuels and very severe fire today when it happens. Most politicians, though, don't get the Southern California issue, which is exactly the reverse, which is way too much fire and environmental degradation because of the frequency of fire. All right. I just the point of my whole presentation is to make clear to you how different these two systems are and how different restoration needs to be in the two systems. So if you look at this graphic, this is the Net California National Forest by those five categories of fire return interval departure or six, I guess. And if you look at Angeles, Cleveland, Los Padres, and San Bernardino, you'll see that they completely buck the standard Western model. In other words, most of the, the landscapes down here are seeing too much fire, whereas almost all the other national forests in California are not seeing barely any fire at all. You wouldn't know that reading the news, but 75% of the mixed conifer forest in California has not seen a fire in over 100 years, whereas it, probably a typical acre would have seen a fire every 7 to 12 years for many, many, many centuries. And I don't think I've got time. I was going to go into some, you know, biodiversity theory stuff. Let's just put it this way, that ecosystems evolve over long periods of time and species evolve and ecosystems uh, organize themselves according to disturbance patterns and the, the physical environment, obviously, in the biotic environment. And when you make big and rapid changes to those things, you affect changes in biodiversity that are usually negative, at least in the shorter term. All right. Make sense? So you can do that either by increasing frequency or decreasing increasing frequency a lot, or by increasing fire severity or decreasing fire severity a lot. You're always going to see some largely negative short-term change in, in biodiversity. Oh, cool. So I went through a whole bunch of those. Just with that, that was great. I got to remember that. I can delete all those slides. Um, uh, so anyway, let's talk a little bit about fire regime one. Um, these are largely open forests of pine and oak. Oftentimes, they're savanna systems. So this... Uh, presentation, I, I've given it overseas way more than I've given it in the U.S., so it's a little bit generalized, okay, so forgive me. But basically, these are, these are systems where the vegetation is dominated by trees that are resistant to fire, but the principal fuel is actually the herbaceous and or litter layers in the understory, all right? The trees themselves relatively rarely, at least before the current accumulation of fuels, played a major role in the actual burn, all right? These are usually found in areas with a long and or profound dry season. In the majority of uh, trees in these systems, you'd see maybe 25%, usually quite a bit less than that, actually killed by fire. The, the ecological role of fire in these kinds of ecosystems is not to create ecological thresholds. It actually maintains the system. If you guys know the genus Pinus, the pines, most of them are pioneer-type species. They cannot be dominants under a sort of a climax situation unless something weird is going on, i.e. crappy soils, highly insulated places or really frequent disturbance that's knocking out all the better competitors. That's the situation that obtained in a lot of the Western US when uh, the Euro-Americans showed up. So fires in these systems under normal burning conditions tend to remain relatively small and easy to control, but you could get fires at the end of the, the dry season with wind too that could become large. In tropical latitudes, we're not in them, so I'm not going to talk about it. Okay, and then the occurrence of fire depends on the coincidence between ignition and the presence of dry fuel. In other words, these are what we call fuel-limited fire regimes. In a ponderosa pine or Jeffrey pine forest, what allows the system to burn under natural conditions is the coincidence of an ignition with enough fuel to actually burn. All right? Believe it or not, in these systems, after you burn them off and burn the fuels off uh, historically in an open forest dominated by pines, it would take you 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 plus years to generate enough fuel, continuous fuel, to even to carry a flame. 
again, okay? So burned areas represented as a result a very important barrier to the passage of future fires. There's been some super cool work done in Yosemite looking at exactly that factor in the Alilouette Basin, which has had 40 years of wild and fire use now. Really cool stuff. Anyway, so if you remove fire from these systems, and particularly I will say this, in California, which is very productive, even though we have this real dry summer, we grow trees big and fast. People come here from New Hampshire and New York and Colorado, they fall to their knees. They can't believe what you can grow in the Sierra Nevada in 30 or 40 years. That's a 150, 200 year old tree in the Colorado Rockies, you know, the size. So you grow a lot of fuel here real quickly if you don't burn the system, all right? And you change the fire regime. So this is something that people don't understand. We talk about these, fire, these forests as being fire regime one, but we're referring to the historical condition of these forests. Today, they are fire regimes three and four. Okay, so they require frequent fire to maintain themselves in the landscape. So here's a great example of the kind of situation you very often see in these kinds of uh, forests. I grabbed this because it was a great example. Obviously, this doesn't always happen. Okay, so these are the Butler 2 slide and Green Valley fires from 2007. Look how they just butt up against more recent fires and they just stop. Now, in some cases, there was some fire suppression activity going on there, but it used the older, the recent fires as places to be able to stop those fires. The red ones next to them are, are the, I believe, the Willow Fire from 99 and the old fire, you guys remember that one from 2003 possibly, okay? That's a very, very standard, typical pattern of burning in mixed conifer forest. Um, these are pictures from Lake Tahoe, just giving an example of what happens. The forests on the top left were restored through a series of entries, prescribed fire. Those forests then burned in the Angora Fire and even under severe weather conditions, five to 20% mortality max because as soon as the fire hit those treatments, it went right to the ground, all right? Burned it like they used to. Bottom left is about a thousand meters from that place. That looks exactly like the forest at the top left looked before, before the three entries. When those forests burned, everything died, okay? Real different outcomes in these systems as a result of fire exclusion. Uh, I'm just, the point here is just that if you look at the blue and the light green areas on this uh, map on the left, that's the distribution of yellow pine systems in the Sierra Nevada from the 1930s Forest Service vegetation mapping. On the right, it's from the mapping in the early 2000s, and you can see the loss of forests dominated by these open pine-dominated um, pine systems. Same thing, that's, just a, that's a, just a fire regime condition class map. And then here's just a, you know, there are millions of these photos uh, from all over the Sierra. This is a photo of Emerald Point at Lake Tahoe in the 1880s. That was one of the few places at lake level that was not cut. You can see it's essentially a savanna in the 1880s and now you can see what it looks like today. We do a lot of work in this stand because it has the biggest, some of the biggest ponderosa pine you'll ever see, 75, 80, 85 inches DBH. And this, this place is in big danger of going up in, in flames. So as a result of this fire, these fuels accumulations, we've had pretty notable changes in um, interaction with climate change, I will say, all right, very, very important. Um, but since the 1980s, the long-term pattern in these systems has changed pretty dramatically. By the way, I, I threw in the first graphic there, you can see a little vertical line. That's about 1935, which was the imposition of the 10, 10 a.m. rule. Okay, obviously fire suppression was going on before that in a lot of the landscape, but after 35, the Forest Service operated under a policy that if you were a district ranger, you had till 10 a.m. the next morning to put the fire out or your job was in serious jeopardy, basically. And you can see they did a damn good job. Look what happens after that, that the 11 year or 10 year running mean just goes down to nothing and just sits there until the 1980s when we start getting this accumulation of fuels gets to the point where the pot starts to boil over. All right, and this is in addition to warming. And if you ever look at those, what was the name of the Al Gore movie again that was, they couldn't sleep after? Inconvenient Truth. You know when he does that cherry picker thing up next to the carbon dioxide thing, he just keeps going and going and going. I mean, that's going on there too, right? Because his, his cherry picker line starts going up about 1980, all right? And so there are clearly also, let's be candid, fire suppression uh, policies, strategies, tactics change pretty notably in the 1980s as well. Anyway, you can see a big change in, in, burn, in annual burned area. You can see a big change in mean fire size. You can see a really big change in maximum fire size, particularly in the last couple of years. And more importantly to me is fire, forest fire severity, which is biomass loss and mortality due to fire is going up over time. I don't think I've got time to talk about this. What, what am I at? Well, maybe I'd use for a second. So when we talk about restoration, I like to talk about what a reference ecosystem would actually look like. And these are just some of the things. 
Pinus dominated, large canopy trees, open canopy, low stem density, low fuel loadings, highly heterogeneous system, lots of diversity in the understory, frequent low severity fire. That's a picture from the Serra de San Pedro Martir in northern Mexico, all right, where that kind of stuff still can happen, although the Mexicans have been putting out fires for the last few decades. We're trying to convince them to stop. Bottom right is the current condition in much of the landscape. It's very different. It's fir, Douglas fir, and incense cedar dominated, mostly small and medium trees, high stem densities, closed canopy, high fuel loadings, low diversity of understory species, very homogeneous. Fire has essentially been absent in the system for about 100 years. It's a fire regime three system now. It's not going to burn at low severity anymore. You burn this thing, if you can get it going, you're going to kill a lot of the trees. So you can align fuel treatments in these kinds of forests very easily with restoration. We're kind of lucky in that. Doesn't mean we don't get constantly sued no matter what we try to do in these forests. But the fact is, is that if you understand the way these forests work, most of our forest thinning projects are really, at, at an ex to an extent, restorative. All right. Treatments are primarily restricted to surface and ladder fuels. Older trees are reta re uh, retained. We do prescribed fire where we can do it, and it requires periodic reentry. So ecological outcomes of pre-fire treatments, they reintroduce low se uh, uh, severity fire, i.e. restoring the main process that was missing. We reduce forest density to reference conditions. You're restoring tree size class distributions. You're increasing forest floor light incidence, which increases understory diversity. You increase heterogeneity, which benefits animal diversity, blah, 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 blah. Okay? So let's talk about fire regime four for a second. And so these are the chaparral and, and serotonous species. So these are ecosystems where the climatic conditions or the lack of an ignition source or the two normally impede the occurrence of fire, all right? So in the years between fires, these systems accumulate a lot of fuel, partly because of productivity, but partly because it's a long time between fires, right? So fire regimes, uh, uh, fires in, in natural ecosystems of fire regime four are really climate limited or ignition limited. That is, when, they're, when they burn, there's always enough fuel in there to really go nuclear, okay? Chaparral can accumulate that fuel pretty quickly, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten years, or even less in some instances, right? It, comes, it goes pretty fast. The issue with chaparral, though, really isn't so much climate because it's, as you know, the fire regime in, or the fire season anymore in Southern California is nearly the entire year. It's really an ignition limited system because, I don't know if you know this, another trivia, California has the lowest lightning strike density of any state in the union and the coast from San Francisco to San Diego has the lowest lightning strike density in the lowest light, lightning strike density in the union. All right, so chaparral basically didn't have a lightning fire regime. Again, I generalize, of course they can happen periodically. And at higher elevation in the San Jacintos or the San Bernardinos, they do happen. And in the mountains, they clearly happen, all right? But the point is, is that this system is driven largely by human ignitions, all right? So vegetation is dominated by woody species that possess adaptations to regenerate after the death of the adult plant. You don't see that in fire regime one forest. It's very uncommon to find species that actually fill that sort of, you know, serotonous or, or fire scarified seed niche. They're just, there are very few of them, all right? So regeneration can uh, occur by way of seeds stored in the soil or by serotony as well. And in these systems, biodiversity is highest in the years after fire. So the whole system is predicated on this just nuclear fire that isn't gonna happen all that often, but when it does, boy, what a bad place to build homes. So fire occurs with a coincidence of ignition, right? And the presence of a suitable, suitable climatic conditions, wind and drought, spectacular fire behavior. You often can't control these things. Fires can become very, very large. And of course, as you all know, the sad truth is that we have built a lot of homes in these systems. So we periodically burn a lot of homes, lose lives and spend billions and wonder where it's all going. So this is an example of uh, fires under Santa Ana wind conditions. These often occur in the, in the early fall, sometimes into the winter. And these days they're occurring even in January and February and March anymore. But you can see this is from which Pumach, I think are 07, right? I get those mixed up with 03. These are just examples of fires that burned under really high winds. And you can see that old fire scars did nothing to stop these fires, absolutely zero. Now. It's important to note that for more than half of the fire season, fuels can play an important role in driving fire, fire behavior in chaparral. They can. It's just that in those seasons, we mostly get the fires put out. This is an example of one we didn't get put out that did follow some of those rules. This is the famous Zaka fire, which is one of the bigger fires in California history. This was also 07, and this was in the summer. 
This one you can see does actually follow some of the old fire scars, right? This occurred mostly under maritime winds, a little bit more humid conditions. This is one that could have been put out, but it was all in wilderness and there just really wasn't any way to do it, right? Anyway, both of these kinds of fires happen, but the really destructive, big, fast ones are ones that occur under conditions where we can't do nothing. I can't do anything anyway. Um, so in Southern California, the trends in fire area number, I want you to note that there is an increase in the last you know, decade or so, but it doesn't occur really until, or more, I guess, but it doesn't occur really till about 2000, all right? Well, uh, who was it? I think Aaron, you showed the drought graph, is that correct? Yeah, you showed the one with the drought. So when we start with the 2000s, we start to see some pretty serious droughts in Southern California. We start to kill some shrubs. And John Keeley and some other folks have noted that the growth of big fires recently seems to possibly be connected to the presence of a lot of dead fuels on the landscape. All right, I won't go in, into that anymore. Okay, uh, Angeles National Forest is a, kind of one of the epicenters. You can see this is, and this is not updated. This is already from a few years ago, but you can see how much of this national forest has burned in the last 10 years. It's pretty extraordinary. All right, so reference ecosystems, Dominated by shrubs, serotonous conifers, closed canopy, high fuel loading, relatively homogeneous understory, a lot of specialized understory species, highly dependent on fire, infrequent fire, high fire severity, right? The current ecosystem is, is not that different in general. However, there are places where serotonous conifers are threatened by too frequent fire or obligate cedars are threatened by too frequent fire. Large areas are converting to grass and herbs. It's a mix of closed and open canopy, high fuel loading still, a little more heterogeneous. There are a lot of exotics and you've got a lot of other issues that I'm not talking about. Air pollution issues, invasive species issues, it, all sorts of stuff goes on. But the system still largely burns the way that it always did. It is not easy to align fuel treatment goals in this vegetation type with restoration goals. In fact, you really can't do it because the treatments require a, a sort of linear strips. You have to enter them regularly with herbicides and mechanical treatment or grazing. And you're basically permanently converting native shrublands to a basis or, 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 uh, or non-native communities. So in terms of the ecological outcomes of pre-fire treatments, um, the treatments themselves are really important. I'm going to talk about that again in a second um, and sort of the conditions under which they can be really useful and important. But treatments have to be easily and safely accessible. And they can, as I said, they can stop fires in, in, in a lot of conditions, but you should not mistake them for restoration. I think we're getting away from it. Back when the agency started with this thing about everything had to be restoration, everyone felt compelled to say that everything we did was restoration. Well, it's not in Chaparral. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing it. Uh, in many cases, but it's simply not restoration. You're creating corridors for exotic species invasion, there's sources of erosion, off-highway vehicle use, access, um, you know, you're, you're maintaining early serial conditions where really the big issue is that the whole damn landscape is early serial conditions anymore in these days in a place like the Angeles National Forest, for example. And you're also creating pretty flashy fuels on a lot of the landscape, which, you know, can make maybe the risk of fire go down a little bit, but the hazard is, is generally a little bit higher actually in those situations. Anyway, I'm not going to dwell on that at all. So a couple things that I want to note, really important when I finish. So most of the fuel treatment work that we do in Southern California and elsewhere in chaparral landscapes is really tied to the disperse, dispersion of, uh, let's put them unfortunately located human homes in an extremely uh, flammable landscape. But you can actually use fuel reduction as a, uh, 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 as a conservation um, action, uh, but you have to understand that it's not happening on the ground you're doing the work on. There are a lot of places out there on the landscape where we have older stands of chaparral, for example, where it would be really nice to maintain older stands of chaparral because there aren't any of them left. The only way you're going to do that is by protecting that site with fuels treatments. Good luck doing anything else. All right. There are a lot of other places, natural habitats, ecosystems, plants and animal habitat that are very sensitive to frequent fire. The only way you'll protect them basically is, is prevention efforts and strategic placement of treatments. So uh, basically, I'm pretty much done here. Uh, I made this whole spiel. You got this. You can't really easily align uh, rest, uh, fuels treatment with restoration in, in the kind of ecosystems we're managing in the lowlands here. But I want to make a couple of points real importantly. These are quotes out of one of the chapters that I authored in the Chaparral book, and I'm just going to read them verbatim because it's important everyone sees them. Fuel management is absolutely necessary in Chaparral landscapes that support human habitation. The impact of Chaparral fuel management must be measured across landscapes and not in single localities, through time, and not at a given instant. 
From the ecological viewpoint, chaparral fuels management needs to be understood as a local resource sacrifice made in order to gain a benefit at the landscape scale. Because of its environmental impacts, chaparral fuel management must be carried out carefully and after comprehensive strategic analysis of the short and long-term local and regional impacts. Environmental con environmentally conscious chaparral fuel management and implementation is becoming progressively more common in California, and many of you in this room have helped to make that happen. Thanks.